Okay, got some snacks, hot coffee. Oh, did you bring a sweater? Yes, here you go. Ah, oh, thank you. Whew, it's so cold up here in this lighthouse. So lonely. Are you sure you don't want a pair of pants, too? So, uh, what are we reading this week? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, um, I brought us a story. <laughs> to keep us company, this is The Foghorn by Ray Bradbury. Oh, excellent. It was recommended by listener Andrew Murphy, and we've got Andrew Lehman as a reader. Oh, I can't wait. Let me just take off this uh, motorcycle helmet I've been wearing throughout this exchange. Ah, I don't even know where I found this. Okay. Ready to listen? <laughs> Let's give this story a spin. HPPodcraft.com Out there in the cold water, far from land, we waited every night for the coming of the fog. And it came... And we oiled the brass machinery and lit the fog light up in the stone tower. Feeling like two birds in the gray sky, McDunn and I sent the light touching out, red, then white, then red again, to eye the lonely ships. And if they did not see our light, then there was always our voice, the great deep cry of our foghorn shuddering through the rags of mist to startle the gulls away like decks of scattered cards and make the waves turn high and foam. Welcome to the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Chad Pfeiffer. We're here at hppodcraft.com. Thanks for tuning in. That was the first paragraph of The Foghorn, read by Andrew Lehman. Remember, if you like what you hear, you can get the complete fiction of H.P. Lovecraft as an audiobook over at CthulhuLives.org. We also need to mention that over at CthulhuLives.org, they are running a raffle through the entire month of February, raffling off four original props from the various movies, and the proceeds are all going to hurricane relief in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is still at least 30% without electricity. Many still don't have drinkable water. Any little bit would help. The first raffle ends this week when someone's going to win the original telephones from the testimony of Randolph Carter. Next, they're raffling off a nickel-plated Legrass idol from The Call of Cthulhu. Then two props from The Whisper and Darkness. They'll also be runners-up who will be getting uh, movies. So go check it out. Raffle tickets are just two bucks each. You can buy as many as you want. It's a great cause. And it's a great chance to win some cool stuff. So check it out at CthulhuLives.org. The Foghorn was written in 1951. This was the first story in Bradbury's third collection, The Golden Apples of the Sun. Bradbury's first collection was Dark Carnival. This is important because it was published by Arkham House in 1947. Yes, of course. Which gives us a tenuous Lovecraft connection. And of course, that book, Dark Carnival, was published under the editorial direction of August Derleth. Oh. Just two years after his own masterpiece, The Lurker at the Threshold, was published. <laughs> <laughs> and that gives us a tenuous connection to last month as well, I suppose. <laughs> Bradbury's second collection after that was The Illustrated Man in 1951, mm -hmm. which was pretty popular. When Guillermo del Toro directed his introduction to The Simpsons, you get a quick glimpse of Lovecraft, have a tea with Cthulhu, mm. Poe with the Raven, and then they show Bradbury and he's hanging out with The Illustrated Man. That's right. You know, this guy that's tattooed with images from his stories. And then uh, we have Bradbury's third collection, The Golden Apples of the Sun, which this is included in. And of course, he'd already published The Martian Chronicles in 1950. Right. Which you could also argue is a short story collection, so maybe this is his fourth. Mm. His novel, uh, Fahrenheit 450, also came out the same year as this collection, 1953. So, like, we're at wow. peak Bradbury strength yeah. right now. And I'm sorry to completely nerd out about it, but... No, that's fine. I'm really excited to, to cover this story and this author. We've only done one other story of his on the show, The October Game. Right. Which was very dark. It was. It was good, but it was pretty pretty evil. And I feel like the Foghorn better represents his work. Yeah. You know, he was my favorite author growing up, more so than Lovecraft or anybody we've covered on the show. Sorry. it's yeah. He was my guy. I would snap up all of his books that I could from the secondhand paperback store. And I think what I responded to was his combination of high concept ideas with basic human struggle. Mm -hmm. His writing style isn't ostentatious. It can be sentimental, but I like sentimental. Mm -hmm. You know, he grew up in Illinois and wound up in Los Angeles and never lost his love for the weird and fantastic. I just relate to him. Sure. And I still read a few of his stories a year. There's always some I haven't read. Clearly, I've got a lot of memories and thoughts about Bradbury, most of which I've actually already shared on the show before, I think. Yeah. So I won't waste anybody's time talking about it unless we have some time at the end. We should just dig into this story. So the story starts off with our narrator, Johnny, and this guy, McDunn, working at a lighthouse. Johnny is supposed to be going into town the next day to carouse and have a good time. They apparently switch off running the lighthouse sometimes. It's fairly clear from the way they relate to each other that Johnny is the newer guy on the job and McDonough is the veteran. And man, that opening paragraph is a beautiful example of storytelling, hmm. getting into a short story. It sets everything up in three mere sentences. The first puts you in the tower in a cold fog far from land 
The second sentence tells you that there are two men up there doing a job, communicating with these lonely ships. That's the nature of the job, Mm -hmm. communication. And the third introduces that foghorn, suggests it has some sort of power over the sea, some sort of indeterminate relationship with the natural Mm -hmm. world out there. It's really economic. It's a powerful use of language. It stands in such stark contrast to August Derleth. (laughs) You know, it was odd to read (laughs) this coming out of that nonsense. It's like, wow. This is what it's supposed to be. So Johnny McDunn seemed to get along very well, which I guess is why McDunn is going to let him in on something. McDunn tells him a few years back that late one night, something odd happened. The tower's foghorn blows and the lights blink back and forth between red and white. In the lights, however, McDunn could see that thousands or even millions of fish came up to the surface and just stared at the lights for a while. And then they just all swam away. (laughs) <laughs> and he remarks how godlike the tower must seem to fish. Its great height, its booming foghorn, its strange flashing lights. It's a truly weird experience. Yeah. They're there and then gone again. And I think this little story serves a couple of purposes. From a structural standpoint, it's kind of a primer for the listener. You know, I'll tell you a small strange story and see how that goes. Yeah. Oh, you went along with me on that one. Great. Here's something really scary. Yeah. And then more importantly, it further pushes this idea that the lighthouse has an effect outside of its intended purpose. It's obviously there to guide ships into the land, but things in the natural world see this lighthouse and they don't have that information. So Mm -hmm. they just come up with their own interpretation of what they think it is, just as humans interpret things in the world beyond their understanding. So McDunn goes on to say that the ocean is unchanging. It's humanity that is not only changing, but humanity is also changing the world. And he tells Johnny that he has something he wants to show him. So they go up to the top of the tower and then he shuts off the room lights in the tower, but the big light's still on and the foghorn goes off every 15 seconds, which, God, that's got to be tedious. Especially these days, now that all the lighthouses have started using ringtones. I just read that over the entire (laughs) eastern seaboard, all you can hear is the chorus of Call Me Maybe on a loop (laughs) all day, all night. (laughs) It's driving folks crazy. I prefer the old foghorns like in this story. So remarking on the horn, McDunn says, Sounds like an animal, don't it? A big lonely animal crying in the night. Sitting here on the edge of 10 million years of calling out to the deeps. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. And the deeps do answer. Yes, they do. You've been here now for three months, Johnny. So I better prepare you. About this time of year, something, something comes to visit the lighthouse. So McDunn says that he doesn't want to seem like an old kook, since he's the only one that's ever seen it. But this thing comes to the lighthouse once a year, right at this time of year. It should be tonight if it comes on schedule. And nobody's ever been with him there before to verify it. He also says, if you see this thing tonight and decide you want to quit lighthouse and altogether, move as far inland as possible and keep your lights on all night, I'll understand. So there's that warning, yeah. that touch of Lovecraftian horror. This thing you're about to see may drive you into the peace and safety of a new dark age. <laughs> in that sense, right. it, it matches the kind of stories we read here. They wait in the dark for about a half an hour before McDunn pops up with his theory about the foghorn. One day, many years ago, a man walked along and stood in the sound of the ocean on a cold, sunless shore and said, We need a voice to call across the water to warn ships. I'll make one. I'll make a voice that is like an empty bed beside you all night long, and like an empty house when you open the door, and like the trees in autumn with no leaves. A sound like the birds flying south crying, and a sound like November wind and the sea on the hard, cold shore. I'll make a sound that's so alone that no one can miss it, that whoever hears it will weep in their souls, and to all who hear it in the distant towns. I'll make me a sound and an apparatus, and they'll call it a foghorn. And whoever hears it will know the sadness of eternity and the briefness of life. Wow, you've really uh, inhabited the character of McDunn. I feel like he's me, deep down. I love that line there, a voice that's like an empty bed beside you all night long. This is what I was talking about when I said Bradbury mixes the high concept with basic human struggle. The worshipping fish story gave us the high concept, Uh that the creatures of the deep are responding to technology in unintended primal ways. And then Mm. McDunn goes on to articulate this very relatable human struggle of just loneliness, yeah. of wishing you had a companion. So it matches the two up pretty well. Gets us right in the position we need to be in for the, the real meat of this story. And McDunn finishes up with, I made up that story to try and explain why this thing keeps coming back to the lighthouse every year. The foghorn calls, I think. It comes. And just then, McDunn sees something and he points at it. 
It was a cold night, as I said. The high tower was cold, the light coming and going, and the foghorn calling and calling through the raveling mist. You couldn't see far, and you couldn't see plain, but there was the deep sea moving on its way about the night earth, flat and quiet, to color of gray mud. And here were the two of us alone in the high tower, and there, far out at first, was a ripple, followed by a wave, a rising, a bubble, a bit of froth. And then, from the surface of the cold sea, came a head, a large head, dark colored with immense eyes, and then a neck. And then, not a body, but more neck and more, the head rose a full forty feet above the water on a slender and beautiful neck. Only then did the body, like a little island of black coral and shells and crayfish, drip up from the subterranean. There was a flicker of tail. In all, from head to tip of tail, I estimated the monster at ninety or a hundred feet. Giant monster, full shot of it, not wasting any time. Yeah. This isn't going to be one of those italicized, I saw its tail in a mirror kind of stories. Full nope. monster right away, right now. Right in your face. So Johnny, he can't believe it. It's a flipping dinosaur, or at least it seems like one. Mm -hmm. Johnny says that they all died out. This can't be possible. But McDunn says, no, they just hit away. Then the horn blows again. And this time the monster answers. A cry came across a million years of water and mist. A cry so anguished and alone, it shuddered in my head and my body. The monster cried out at the tower. The foghorn blew. The monster roared again. The foghorn blew. The monster opened its great toothed mouth, and the sound that came from it was the sound of the foghorn itself, lonely and vast and far away. The sound of isolation, a viewless sea, a cold night, a partness. That was the sound. The foghorn sounds like it's a call. Yeah. And McDunn has a theory, based on absolutely nothing, <laughs> that it just waits around at the bottom of the sea in the deep ocean, and that it's alone, the last of its kind, waiting for millions of years. It slowly wakes up, but it takes time for it to move to the upper levels to get used to the pressure variants, and then eventually it's ready to come out on the surface. It's a theory. I mean, you say it's based in nothing, but that's not entirely true. You know, he's making guesses based on the thing's behavior and its size. Yeah, but... And he's also saying the whole time he does it, he's going, maybe it's like this, maybe it's like that. He's just speculating, really, as he's been doing the whole time. That it's waiting for millions of years sleeping? Well, maybe it's got a whole little civilization down there that it's hanging out and doing stuff, and then it hears that. Like, <laughs> I know, but I agree with you. I'm just saying that this doesn't sound like a crazy speculation. Mostly, when we're covering stories like that, you know, if he was a character from one of those, he'd say, mm, I believe it's a survival of a snake race worshipped by Pacific <laughs> Islanders. And there's a certain <laughs> formula to trap it in certain books. But there's none of that stuff. I mean, it is something you might go. And look, I think we're dealing with this poetic, seafaring oh, kind yeah. of storyteller no, guy. It's so McDunn. When he, when he sees this, he McDunn kind of wants everything to be wrapped in a sort of romantic package, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I agree. He, he continues to speculate. Read this where it says maybe it's the last of its kind. Maybe it's the last of its kind. I sort of think that's true. Anyway, here come men on land and build this lighthouse five years ago and set up their foghorn and sound it and sound it out towards the place where you bury yourself and sleep and see memories of a world where there were thousands like yourself. But now you're alone, all alone in a world that's not made for you, a world where you have to hide. Oh, man. it gets to me, man. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not true, but this poor creature is so alone in the story, and I felt that alone even in a crowd. Maybe there are people everywhere. Sure. But you have that feeling like, I wish I could find one of my kind, somebody who gets me, somebody who gets it. Does that person even exist? Yeah. And I think it's it's so cool. We've just seen this dinosaur emerge from the water, but this is where we are in the story. It's, I just, just really need how he, he does this trick. I get it, but McDonough is really projecting here. Well, I think McDunn might be having something in his history that we don't know about for sure. There's obviously there's something going on with McDunn. Yeah, because I mean he's putting a lot on on this uh, sea monster here. Oh, he could have just as easily gone. Well, clearly that monster has been spoiling for a fight. Yeah, and he's just looking for somebody to challenge him. Yeah, and now you know if he. But yeah, but I that's think. not where he goes with it. So Johnny is on board with this. I think you know what's going on with McDunn. <laughs> that's why you're 
characterization is so... <laughs> oh, I know what's going on with McDonough. Don't you worry about that. Emotionally entangling, yeah. For some reason, Johnny is totally on board with everything McDonough's saying. He says, I saw it all. I knew it all. The million years of waiting alone for someone to come back who never came back. The million years of isolation at the bottom of the sea. The insanity of time there. While the skies cleared of reptile birds, the swamps fried on the continental lands, the sloths, the saber-tooths had their day and sank in tar pits, and men ran like white ants upon the hills. Mm. McDunn says that last year, the creature just swam around all night and then went away. Says the monster didn't like the light and heat of the day. The monster scrammed, waiting for a better opportunity, and I guess they're assuming it's going to do the same thing this time, because while they are impressed by its size, the thing is huge. And the fact that it's out there doing call and respond with the foghorn... In spite of all that, they're still speculating. I mean, they're not running away. They're not that scared. So no. I, it feels like they assume, well, oh, he'll he'll moan for a while and then he'll leave. So McDen kind of ties it all together as part of his, you know, philosophy and his inner story that he seems to be telling through this creature. That's life for you. Someone always waiting for someone who never comes home. Always someone loving something more than that thing loves them. And after a while, you want to destroy whatever that thing is so it can hurt you no more. Judy taught me that lesson. And I've learned, <laughs> at least I tell myself that, but I know if she walked back in that door, I'd fall all over again. Oh, you do know. None of that's in the story. All that Judy stuff is. Oh, it's there. It's in the subtext. Well, this is the cool thing uh, with with the character and what he's talking about. His story sort of sets up, okay, we've already gotten that this creature's lonely. We can empathize with that. But then it brings in some human psychology yeah. when he says... After a while, you want to destroy whatever that thing is so it can hurt you no more. Mm -hmm. And that's what propels the story toward a climax. When you're in this lonely state, you're so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Maybe you think, oh, this person, they get me. So you reach out and you're either rejected or used mm -hmm. or ridiculed, which is the fear that I think most people have. And that leads to anger and to all sorts of destructive behavior, self-destructive behavior, overtly destructive behavior that's just with people so what's going to happen when this monster you know yeah <laughs> doesn't get what it wants out of this lighthouse yeah. so as a little experiment mcdunn decides to turn off the lights and the foghorn to see what happens <laughs> the beast freezes and then stares for a minute and then charges the lighthouse johnny yells at mcdunn turn the lights back on mcdunn fumbled with the switch but even as he switched it on the monster was rearing up I had a glimpse of its gigantic paws, fish skin glittering in webs between the finger-like projections clawing at the tower. The huge eye on the right side of its anguished head glittered before me like a cauldron into which I might drop, screaming. The tower shook. The foghorn cried. The monster cried. It seized the tower and gnashed at the glass which shattered in upon us. That was not a smart experiment. No! <laughs> <laughs> he just said, I feel like if it gets rejected that it might destroy us all. Hey, let's play with it. <laughs> Turn off the light and fog. No, why did you do that, McDonough? So they run downstairs into the basement as the whole lighthouse topples. Yeah, it's a pretty harrowing climax because this thing's attacking and you really can't escape a tower no. when it's falling around you. So they run straight down into the cellar and they get buried there by the rubble of the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really embellished upon, but I was thinking about it. They're out there in the middle of nowhere. I think yeah. earlier in the story it's set up that there was not a town for 100 miles around and that this rock that the lighthouse is on is even that is two miles out into the sea. Mm -hmm. I just get so claustrophobic about they could be buried alive out there. It's yeah. horrible. After the tower topples, everything goes quiet. We waited a moment, and then I began to hear it. First a great vacuumed sucking of air, and then the lament, the bewilderment, the loneliness of the great monster folded over upon us, above us, so that the sickening reek of its body filled the air a stone's thickness away from our cellar. The monster gasped and cried. The tower was gone. The light was gone. The thing that had called it across a million years was gone. And the monster was opening its mouth and sending out great sounds, the sounds of a foghorn, again and again. And ships far at sea, not finding the light, not seeing anything, but passing and hearing late that night, must have thought, there it is. The lonely sound, the lonesome bay horn. All's well. We've rounded the cape. So the beast keeps baying all through the night, perhaps lamenting a lost love, like Judy. <laughs> if only I bought Judy that car that she asked for. 
I couldn't afford it. I was only working at a <laughs> coffee house. Maybe she'd still be in my life. Oh my God, poor guy. So heartbreaking. Both your story and this Ray Bradbury story. <laughs> it's not my story, it's McDunn's. I'm sorry, you're right, McDunn's. Boy, you really have inhabited him. I'm worried about your sanity. Me too, man. We gotta cut to the epilogue of this podcast. Well, it turns out that Chris was too good of an actor. <laughs> He grew into two personalities. There was the normal Chris that we all knew, a reasonable man. And then there was McDunn, <laughs> mournful, sad, destructive. <laughs> you know what the story makes me think of is that dog Hachiko in Japan from the 1920s. He's kind of legendary. They have a statue of the dog in front of Shibuya Station in Tokyo now. Mm. And it was this dog that would meet his owner every evening at the station to walk home from work. Mm. But in 1925, his owner didn't return because he passed away from a cerebral hemorrhage. And not understanding this, Hachiko waited every day at the station oh, God. for his master for nine years. Oh. <laughs> and there's a statue commemorating the dog. Now, of course, they made that into an episode of Futurama, yeah, uh, which is a devastating one to watch. Devastating. Yeah. This creature was coming around for a few years, though, the creature in the, in the story, thinking it would be relieved of its loneliness uh. if it could only find the, the thing that was sending out this call. And then in a, in a moment of destructive behavior, it's all taken away. Yeah. Ugh, it's rough. So the next day, the guys are rescued. Yes, they have to be dug out. And again, you didn't spend much time lingering on this, but I was like, I mean, how did you know that people were going to come the next day? If there's nobody around for hundreds of miles, <laughs> might they not notice that the, I guess the the ships would call in? Or? I guess so, yeah. So that Hey, the tower's missing. Or maybe Johnny was expected in town and he didn't show up. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Well, could be. clearly I'm claustrophobic because I got really focused on this, <laughs> even though it's barely mentioned in the, in the story. <laughs> so McDonough tells the authorities that a big wave knocked the tower down. I guess because nobody would believe him, but also maybe because he felt bad for the creature and he didn't want it to be hunted. Yeah, I felt like he totally covered for the monster, yeah. which is cool. Yeah, It's rare that we have a story where the characters cover for the monster. <laughs> So the next year, they rebuild the lighthouse tower. McDunn, still in charge there, had the tower built stronger, this time with reinforced steel, just in case. And Johnny, he moves into town, gets a new job, a girl, a house. All seems to work out for him. All seems to work out for him. But yeah. I think he retreated inland like McDonough had warned him might happen. Right. Because it sounds nice, but if you listen to it, I had a job in the little town and a wife and a good small warm house that glowed yellow on autumn nights. The doors locked, the chimney puffing smoke. So I think it's emphasis on the doors are locked and the lights are on all night, just as was predicted by McDonough. Hmm. He doesn't want any creatures coming around to romance his thermostat or something like that <laughs> once he's had this experience. Can you imagine if that became his pathology after this experience? He was just worried about, turn off that alarm clock. There might be a pterodactyl that wants to make love to that thing. You don't know. <laughs> that refrigerator is too noisy. It breeds a distrust of technology as well because it might That's possibly right. attract a dinosaur. That's right. <laughs> looking for a mate. But what about this new lighthouse? Is it having any effect on uh, the monster? It never came back. It's gone away, said McDunn. It's gone back to the deeps. It's learned you can't love anything too much in this world. It's gone into the deepest deeps to wait another million years. Ah, the poor thing. Waiting out there and waiting out there while man comes and goes on this pitiful little planet. Waiting and waiting. I sat in my car, listening. I couldn't see the lighthouse or the light standing out in Lonesome Bay. I could only hear the horn. The horn, the horn. It sounded like the monster calling. I sat there wishing there was something I could say. And that's the end of the story. Yeah. You kind of shed an interesting light on this for me as we were going through it. Mm -hmm. Our perspective I didn't think about, which is that <laughs> I was saying that the fish see the lighthouse they make something up about it that makes sense to them. Right. And the same with this monster. But really, it's kind of McDonn who's doing that. He sees this monster just come in and wreck a lighthouse. Who knows why he did it? You yeah. Know? Or who knows why he's showing up? Yeah. And he goes, oh, you can't love anything too much. Yeah, he's still hung up on Judy and everything gets put through that filter. Yeah, but for real, I mean, you can look at this as a perfect example of a human personifying nature, you know, oh, right. finding things. Yeah. Because it could have just been like, you know, oh, I'm so annoyed by that sound. Finally, it's done. Great. I can go back down to being a monster in the icy depths like I really like. Yeah. What do you make of that ending line? Uh, I sat there wishing there was something I could say. Because I'm totally on Team Judy here with this thing. <laughs> yeah. I think what it's about is him wanting to say something to McDonough, something to make him feel better about his life. <sighs> oh, that's good. Yeah, sure. He wants to reassure him. I love that it resists 
the urge from this era for a pat sci-fi summation of things. Yeah. As man continues to do science, he must watch and fear the unseen things in the world. Yeah. None of that yeah. at all. And I thought when he describes the foghorn earlier in the story, when McDonough does, mm-hmm. he says, whoever hears it will know the sadness and eternity and the briefness of life. Mm-hmm. And I feel like reading the story is a lot like hearing the foghorn. When you get done with it, you kind of come off with that feeling of sadness. Oh, yeah. And the futility of our, you know, our desire to to have somebody know us. Uh And Bradbury is kind of letting you know in that sentence, you know, I wish I could cheer you up after all that, but it is what it is. You know, I can't, there's (laughs) nothing I can say to you that's going to make you feel better about that. So it it, it also, you know, it's also Bradbury doing the same thing with us as the reader. Yeah. So I think it's such a great ending line. Yeah. You you wanted to discuss some background on the story. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, The original title for the story was The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, published in the Saturday Evening Post. Some film producers were working on a movie with a similar idea, so they decided to build on Bradbury's popularity and bought the rights to the story. The monster from the movie was based on the drawing that was in that issue of the Saturday Evening Post. Is there a link to that that we could share? There's a link to that. We'll, I'll share it to you. It's uh, it's pretty cool. It looks just exactly like the monster from The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which was a, uh, a Ray Harryhausen film. Right, that, that was the movie that that it ended up being and the producers had changed it to the beast from 20,000 fathoms because they wanted to capitalize on the connection to Bradbury since that was the name of the story yep. in the Saturday evening post. But then Bradbury changed the name of the story to the foghorn, <laughs> which is how we're reading it now. And I don't think he did that because he didn't like the movie. It's just that the movie is very different oh, yeah. from this story. But Bradbury maintained a lifelong friendship with Ray Harryhausen. I, and that movie is one of Harryhausen's masterpieces. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, it came out in 1953. It's really fun to watch. I actually just watched it again the other night, and I think I'd seen it on cable when I was a kid. It's always interesting because you think you've seen a movie, right? But I'd only really Mm -hmm. watched the last 10 minutes of it when the dinosaur destroys the city. Right. But basically, it uses the story more as a jumping off point. Even in the credits, it says suggested by the story, you know, by Ray Bradbury. Yeah. And the plot of the movie may sound very familiar to you. The military is testing out some atomic bombs in the Arctic Circle. Uh, that causes a, a giant dinosaur monster to become unfrozen from a glacier. That old chestnut. Yep. The monster swims toward New York, wrecks havoc on the city. Now, on its way, it stops off at a lighthouse. So you, you, you can see what it looks like when the monster gives that lighthouse what for. You've got the guys running down the <laughs> stairs and everything. It, it is just like that image from the magazine. Yeah. By the way, there's also some great stock footage in that movie of an, of an octopus fighting a shark. What? Yeah, it's cool. It actually is pretty cool. <laughs> I think that's originally what the movie was going to be about, some giant octopus, so they still had it. There's a, a guy goes down in a diving bell to see the actual creature in the movie, uh-huh. and then he goes, oh, look over there, and then you watch an octopus and a shark fight for a while, <laughs> which I am not complaining about. I wish there was... That's a good movie to me. Oh, golly. But the movie is significant because of Harry Harryhausen's stop-motion work, obviously. Yeah. Which is so great, and the creature's got a lot of personality. There's this part in the movie I love where he's in the street and the military guys are shooting at him and you just see him kind of go, ah, screw this. And he breaks through the middle of a building and moves over a block. But there's so (laughs) much like just exasperation in it. I love it. Yeah. The the movie was very successful and it launched that whole atomic age of giant monsters wrecking stuff from the 50s. Them. All right. And most significantly, it inspired Toho to make Godzilla about 16 months later. Oh, right. Of course. So thank you, Ray Bradbury. Without this story, no Godzilla. Oh, wow. Can you imagine a world without Godzilla? I'm incapable of doing so. Without the foghorn. So Bradbury said he got the idea for the story by seeing a demolished roller coaster on the beach. Yeah, which is kind of, and I don't know if they did that on purpose, but at the end of the movie, when they confront the beast, it's in a roller coaster structure, like wrapped around it. Oh, right. Which is cool. But Bradbury was, you know, there was an old abandoned amusement park that he saw, and he was walking with his wife. This is Bradbury recounting it. Uh, I was walking with Maggie one night on the beach as the fog rolled in and looked out and saw the old roller coaster lying over on its side with its bones in the sand in the water and the wind blowing over its skeleton. I looked at it and said to Maggie, I wonder what that dinosaur is doing lying on the beach. And then later that night, he says he was awakened by the sound of a foghorn blaring. So there you go. To turn into the story. Bradbury said the success of the story got him the attention of John Huston, the OG Gandalf, <laughs> to write the 1956 screenplay for Moby Dick. Which is a great movie. And I uh, met Bradbury at a screening of it in Hollywood. So oh, this right. story led to both Godzilla and me peeing my pants a little bit because I got to meet Ray Bradbury. Bradbury did a play version of this, which was part of his Pillar of Fire and other plays. And he did that in 1975. Mm-hmm. And last but not least, Leonard Nimoy said that the story inspired him when writing Star Trek The Voyage Home. How? I have no idea, but 
It was in his book, I Am Spock. You don't... I totally get that. Uh, what? That was the whole the whole wraparound of the voyage home is um, they get the distress call. Yeah. But Earth can't respond because the humpback whales are extinct. So they have to go back in time and get some humpback whales, right? Oh, right. So it's a okay. call and response thing between an ocean It's a call and response thing. And, I gotcha. Oh my I God. forgot about that. Did I just out Star Trek you? You did. Oh, my God. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> Up is down and left is right. Uh, me and Bizarro. I was thinking of the whales. That's all that, that stuck in my head. And then, of course... Kirk and Spock saying that they love Italian food. Well, as Spock's headband, you know, these are the things that come into mind yeah. when I think of that movie. Punk rocker getting Vulcan nerf pinched. Yeah, exactly. The great thing about that movie is it's really, I mean, it starts in a typical Star Trek way, but then it becomes an ensemble comedy. Yeah. And it's the only one of the movies that plays like that. You're not laughing at it because it's campy. You're laughing at it because they wrote jokes that are really funny. Yeah, it's genuinely good. Actually, when you think about it, if whoever ran that amusement park hadn't been terrible with their money... Lost the title on it. It fell into disrepair. Ray Bradbury saw it, wrote this story. We get Godzilla. We get a Star Trek ensemble comedy. That poor guy lost his shirt. But look at all the cultural benefit that came from it. It's beautiful. I want to thank Andrew Murphy for selecting this story once again. I actually got to spend some time with Andrew while we were in Providence. All right. Last time for the Economic Con. He's a super cool guy. And clearly he knows he knows what's good. Yeah, it's a good story, and it is actually pretty weird. Yeah, it is, for sure. I also want to thank Andrew Lehman for reading once again. Don't forget to investigate CthulhuLives.org for all of their radio dramas and audiobooks and movies and everything. That's all we have for this week. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey, and you've been listening to the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. At HPPodcraft.com. More Coco, Chad? Yeah, just let me put this helmet back on. HPPodcraft.com. Ah!